نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألم نشرح لك صدرك وبشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون When modernity took over the Muslim world there were different cultures there was the Chinese culture the Indian culture the European culture, different cultures throughout the world. And before the coming and the overtaking of the Western way of life, and when I say Western, I don't mean that in a negative way. You can say I'm talking more about modernity. What are the changes that have occurred? And what I want to get to is, is not to, is to, for us to understand how modernity affects us, how the changes that have happened over time, how they affect our Iman, how they affect our thinking, how they affect how we look at things. And so my, uh, if somebody finds what I'm going to say a little bit offensive, it's not, the point is not, I'm not here to hurt someone. I'm here to try to make an analysis and maybe enlighten us and put nur in our hearts, nur of knowledge in our hearts. <clears throat> so when modernity took over, you know, the whole world slowly started adapting the same way of life. For example, the same culture permeated the whole world. Whether you were Chinese, you started wearing the, a certain type of clothes. And if you were Pakistani, you started wearing the same type of clothes. And it didn't matter. Jeans now are, jeans are the clothes of the world. And so before jeans, there were other clothes that were brought from the modern world to the rest of the world. And no matter which part of the world you lived in, those were the clothes that you began to adapt. Now, why am I saying this? Because this process of almost 200 years, where slowly our culture has been replaced by another culture, and slowly our way of life has been replaced by another way of life, especially at the political, economic level. There's no question about that. But now, uh, even more so at the individual level. But it also affected our thinking. It began to affect our thinking. You see, people always look up to the conqueror, even if the conquered is done wrong too. I'll give you an example. Brother, uh, Brother Abdul Razak is here and he'll confirm what I'm saying. And those of you people who have read American history, especially of the 60s, will know what I'm talking about. That in the 1960s, the black man used to try to become as white as possible. They would, the black people would take their afro and try to straighten their hairs like the white man and would try to dress like the white man and all that because it is natural that the people that are conquered and the people that are oppressed always end up being just like the conqueror. This is how even in family life, if, you're, if someone in your family oppresses you too much, you will actually end up being very much like them. Another example of this is 
the Jewish people, they had the Holocaust. Now the same Jewish people that had the Holocaust are causing a Holocaust in Palestine. So it's very hard to come out of the environment that you were given. And if you come out of the environment that you were given and you are given some authority or some power, you are also likely to behave how you were treated. This is, this is history. This is history. So, modernity came and modernity came with a lot of beautiful things. We know this. But one of the results of the coming of modernity was we became embarrassed because we were adopting another lifestyle. The issue is not a fiqhi issue. The issue is not a legal issue of legal jurisprudence. The issue is not, is, is it allowed to wear Western clothes or not wear, of course it's allowed to wear. Pants don't belong to any particular person, any, any culture. It's, uh, it doesn't, you know, things of, of dress, Imam Nathania has the famous fatwa that dresses don't belong to a particular culture. Uh, meaning anyone from any culture can wear anything. A Muslim can wear clothes of another culture. There's no, nothing wrong with that. I'm not talking from a legalistic perspective, but I'm talking from a cultural, psychological perspective that as we began, began to adapt another way of life, we became slightly embarrassed of what we had. I'll give you an example. Now, like I said, don't, I'm just making my point. Okay. So, for example, having the beard was considered, oh, you know, this is something that is disliked in, with what the modern world had brought. And so that is my only point. My only point is to share with you something like this. Or I'll give you another example. Eating with your hands instead of fork and spoons. We've all experienced this. Every one of us. Everyone sitting here. We all know the, you can say, the shyness or the embarrassment we would feel if we were eating with our hands instead of sports and fork and spoons. And those people that have been with me in places to eat, they know I use fork and spoons just as much as I use my hands. So the point is not, oh, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to give a fatwa, do this. I'm talking about a psychological phenomenon that is occurring in our minds. And so, we feel shy even though, let me contrast this with something. Because alhamdulillah, I'm married to my wife and she has a Christian family and gives me a lot of insight into the other side. Tremendous amount of insight. But the other side, the, the, the culture that is being, the, the super culture that is being imposed upon the, you can say, the, the weaker culture, kids grow up being taught Santa Claus is real. Every year, Till they're 10, 11 years old, they buy literally thousand dollar presents every Christmas. And talk about Santa. Not only does the household do this, but the school is also fully involved in promoting the idea of Santa Claus, some Santa guy, he comes into the chimney, gives you gifts. All these things happen. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I'm trying to explain to you that there are things in their culture that they have that if you really look at it and analyze it, it is quite embarrassing. The idea that you're teaching kids to lie from a young age. And there's many other aspects. I mean, there's the whole commercialization and just focusing on things and, and just, you know, Christmas is the biggest time of, of, of the market, one of the biggest times for the marketplace to 
where the market spends money, and, and that's fine. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is we have become, culturally speaking, embarrassed with our Islam. And I'd like to share something with you today uh, regarding this. There's a new research out. I don't know how many people know this, but it's becoming popular now. It's a new trend in America to have beards. I don't know those of you who have been following Duck Dynasty, any of you? Any of you have been following Duck Dynasty? And, and America is beginning to get away from the, I don't want to use the word right now, but a certain look to a more bearded look. So, what happened as a result of this bearded look phenomenon that is happening in America, if you notice more and more people are on TV have beards, more and more actors have beards, more and more singers have beards, more and more, I mean, you just, just it all started probably with the Duck Dynasty phenomenon, I don't know how many people know about that, uh, but then it went on, and uh, so now they did some research about having beards. And again, my hope, my hope is, is not that you all start wearing beards, because that's, in the long scheme of things, that's not a big issue per se. But the issue that I want to raise is that, is more of the psychological aspect of how we sometimes are shy of who we are. And you know, Jews, they use this word for themselves uh, that's very applicable to Muslims, because even the Prophet said that you will be just like the Jews, right? You know, if, if, you, if the, one of them went into a lizard hole, you would go into a lizard hole. So our, our psyches work very much the way the Jewish psyche works. As much as, you know, and it's so interesting that our, uh, you can say, uh, the Jewish people are, so to say, a, a sister ummah for us to look at. And the Prophet told us, you'll make all the mistakes and you do everything that they did. So as much as the world dislikes Jews, or as much as, Sometimes Muslims dislike Jews. We are as Jewish as Jewish people, according to many sayings of the Prophet But anyway, the point I wanted to make was that, uh, so there was a research done on having beards. So I'm reading this to you from <clears throat> uh, Men's, uh, men, it's a men's health magazine. It's called mensxp.com. I can give you the references. This is not the only place this is, but this is in a few other places. What does a beard do? Prevents skin cancer. Recent researches have shown that 95% of UV, ultraviolet rays, from the sun are blocked by beards. You can expect basically the same logic would also apply on hijab, by the way. And you know, skin cancer is the largest cancer, so the beard does protect you from skin cancer. Recent researches have shown that 95% of UV rays from the sun are blocked by beards. Besides keeping the sun out of your face, this is also important ex as exposure to UV rays can cause cancer. The thicker the hair, the better. <coughs> this is the first benefit. Second, reduction of asthma and allergy symptoms. I'll explain this to you because the article is a little bit longer. But you know, just as you have hair in your nose to filter bad air, the hair follicles work as a filtering system. You're in the in the same circumference around your face. Your beard also works as a filtering system of the air that goes into you. So he says, if you suffer from pollen or dust allergy or even asthma, facial hair actually help by working as a filter and prevent allergens from setting. This is not much different from nasal hair. Staying young. Here's your secret to naturally lessen, lessening signs of aging. With lesser sun exposure, you can actually continue to look younger. Unlike the guys who do not go for beards, paradox of sorts, beards can make you look older, but actually keep you looking younger. I, know, I knew this through my experience, that when I was young and I had a beard, and when I was in my 20s, people thought I was in my 30s and 40s because I had a beard. And now that I'm in my 40s, people think I'm in my 30s. And the skin does remain soft. I mean, this is uh, something that I know through personal experience. Um, uh, as far as illnesses, uh, 
summer may be coming now, but when it gets biting cold during fall or winter, the beard will keep you warm and can actually help you battle cold colds. The longer the beard, the better insulation you get. And this is kind of logical. Reduce infections. You never have to worry about bacterial infections in growths. Meaning when you're shaving, sometimes you cut yourself and stuff like that. Uh, with a beard. These infections are occupational hazards of, reg of regular shaving. But done with that and be done with, meaning if you don't do that, be done with that and be done with such problems as well. Blemish-free skin, number six. Natural moisture. The hair naturally has certain enzymes and most moisture that keep your face moisturized as long as you have your beard on your face. What is the point I'm trying to make? I'm not trying to say, okay, tomorrow everybody come here and have a beer. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that we have to realize that when we feel embarrassed about Islam, we may not know the reasons, and this is you know, one of the things about Islam, is that Islam gives us the action, it gives us the concrete. Like Hajj, Hajj is the concrete. You know that it represents uh, all of humanity going to Hajj under one God, wearing the same dress, all of humanity under one God. You know it represents that, but it doesn't say any hadith says, oh, this is the oneness of humanity under God. It doesn't say that, but it represents that. And it's understood that it represents that because we observe that and we can see that. So Islam gives us the answer without giving us, you can say, the questions. Or Islam gives us the solution to things without knowing which solutions the problems are to. In the same way, because now time is running out, eating with your hands. Like I said, I myself don't always eat with my hands. But I'm just trying to make a point that if we're not following the sunnah, we should not be embarrassed of it. If we're not following the sunnah, if we're not following something the Prophet did and the, something the Prophet commanded to do, then we shouldn't at least be embarrassed by it because this is what's happening with the Muslims that we're becoming embarrassed by Islam. And in fact, science is helping us understand even the lifestyle of the Prophet better. For example, eating with your hands. You know, you could say from the 60s to today, the two most embarrassing things may be about the Islamic lifestyle. One was you know, the beard. And the eating of the hands, you could say, as far as public life was concerned. But what we learn now is that New York Times had a, a editorial piece on about eating food with your hands. And it's when you eat things with your hands, you pay more attention to what you're eating. When you pay more attention to what you're eating. I'll give you an example. They did a research. They had two groups of people. They had one group concentrate on the fact that they're eating, so they're concentrating on their food. Okay. And another group of people, they, had, they were playing a game while eating. So what happened as a result? The people that were playing games while they were eating kept eating more, more and they didn't feel full for a longer time than those people that were calm and just concentrating on their food. <coughs> they finished food, eating food as a whole, on general, 15 minutes earlier than the other group. And then when they were given some, I forget it was cake or biscuits, but when they were given some desserts, at the end of that food, the group that had been playing and was distracted kept eating more of the, uh, the sweets afterwards also than the group that had been concentrating on eating. One of the things that happens by eating, when you eat with your hands, by the way, is that it starts sending messages to your brain early on that you're already eating. And it starts making you feel full faster. And there's a lot of research that shows this. I mean, everything from, you know, when you start smelling the food, I mean, it's like this natural process. When you start smelling the food, you, your saliva starts to kick in. You know, your saliva starts to kick in, your stomach digestive starts to kick in. But when you start touching your food, you're already feeling like as if you've already, and you know what's interesting, the Prophet, the way he ate it, if you look at it as one full system, which is he didn't he concentrated on his eating, right? He took small, the Prophet used to eat with three fingers. This is the sunnah of the Prophet. And again, I'm not trying to say this is what everybody needs to do tomorrow. I'm just trying to say that we shouldn't be embarrassed of our Prophet. And we shouldn't be embarrassed of our Islam. 
And the things that we sometimes find shy are actually quite reasonable in the light of when we look at the data that's out there. So the Prophet would look, take three, eat with three pieces of his fingers, and he would concentrate on his food, and he would be sitting down, and when the Prophet would sit down, which I can demonstrate for you, is he would have one leg up like this. When you have one leg up, what happens? Your stomach pulls in. Your stomach goes in. What happens when your stomach goes in is that you feel full faster. You feel full faster. And so you eat less. And you end up doing what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, one third for food, one third for air, one third for water. And this is, this is exact. I read a book. I wish I had this book. I would have read it to you. The exact same. It was a small book about food. Eating food in, in a healthy way. There was a chapter, the whole chapter of that book. And this is not some book written 20, 30 years ago. This book was written within the last five years about food. The whole chapter was one saying of the Prophet, which is, have one third air, one third food, and one third water. But he didn't just say it, he demonstrated how you can do that. If you're concentrating on your food, if you're eating with your hands, if you're sitting in a certain way, then you will end up eating less food and still feel full. And so the, the point is that we have enough data to be proud that we are Muslims. We have enough data to be happy that we're Muslims. Inshallah, I will continue in my next khutbah, but I'm just simply saying that because of this certain lifestyle that has, you can say, overpowered us, and because it's overpowered us, what has happened as a result is that we've become shy with many aspects of Islam, particularly the sunnahs of certain certain doings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, I will, inshallah, continue in my next khutbah. Astaghfirullah wa lakum wa lisa'ad muslimina wa muslimina. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله. I wanted to talk about two other aspects of the Prophet's life, but I'm not going to do that because of lack of time at this point. But I did want to say that how can we help our children appreciate the lifestyle of the Prophet? How can we help our children not be shy about Islam? How can we help the coming generation be having that effect that you are like the ones that are overpowering you to come out of that, come out of the process of victimization because Muslims are victimized. Muslims are victimized. And because we're victimized, we act like victims. We respond like victims. And because we respond like victims, we are kind of like caged. And so I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is that we all have to give it a deep thought. You, to come out of this victimization, you have to think about Islam. Not react to Islam. Think about it from, uh, from its perspective. Think about Islam from Islam's perspective, rather than from the other perspective. When you have a master over you, and you're the slave, you become used to looking at things from the master's perspective. As Malcolm X was saying one time uh, in, a, in a debate, you know, when the, slave, when the slave serves the master and the master is sick, what does the slave say? We sick, master. We sick. And this is how we are. We don't, we don't think from things from our perspective. We always filter things that we are supposed to think from our perspective from what others are thinking. How others will look at Islam, how others will look at the Sunnah. And especially, this is a natural process, especially you know, if you have been disciplined and trained and, and, and uh, you can say cultured in, in an environment that has given you so much. And so we have to be careful how we think. We have to think about Islam from, the, from Islam's own perspective. 
And you know, what has happened is, and this is kind of like a little bit academic, but there is a subject that they teach in the universities in this country, it's called Orientalism. And Orientalism is the subject of looking at everything in the East with a microscope. What do I mean by that? Oh, why do they do this? Why do they say this? Why do they do this? Why do they say this? And there have been many famous Orientalists, some in, that were more in the favor of Islam, like Edward Said, I don't know if anyone knows that. Or there were many, many like Bernard Shaw and the others that were totally, Bernard, Bernard Lewis, I don't know if you know, but the greatest Mufassir of Quran in the West, who's considered the greatest Mufassir, the explanator, the one who explains the Quran the best, is sitting in Princeton University, he hates Islam, he's considered the the, the par excellence of, of Islamic ex explanation of Quran. It happened, just, just as a historical point I want to mention, when in the uh, time of Reagan, the Iranian hostage system, ha uh, the Iranian hostage happened, uh, Iran sent a letter to the US Congress that, okay, we'll release the hostages, do Toba. So the Congress is sitting there trying to understand, what is Toba, what do they want us to do? So who is the professor that they invited? His name was Fadl Rahman. He was a Muslim intellectual from University of Chicago. And uh, by the way, I, I don't want to go into this, but John, uh, Fadl Rahman is the teacher of people like Abu Rab uh, uh, Professor Rabi. He's the professor of Ingrid Matson. Do you know uh, Ingrid Matson from Isna? He was the teacher of Ingrid Matson. He was the teacher of uh, John Esposito in, John, uh, in, uh, in Georgetown University. This man was the teacher of a lot of intellectuals. This guy, Fadl Rahman Ansari. I don't agree with everything he says, but he had a very positive influence. Uh, this guy in uh, wa George, uh, uh, George Washington University, uh, 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 Sayyid uh, Hussein Nasser, uh, whose student, Sheikh Ahmed, uh, Brother Ahmed, he was a student of Sayyid Hussein Nasser. Sayyid Hussein Nasser was a student of Fadl Rahman. And so their thoughts are very much similar. This is the one whose name in whose we're opening this library. So it actually is good that I mentioned this, just so you kind of understand. Uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr's teacher is Fadl Rahman. Fadl Rahman was an extraordinarily genius scholar. Extraordinarily genius scholar. Um, we don't have to agree with everything that he said, but the things that he said were, that were good were very, very good. So the point I'm trying to make here is, is that there's no even Muslim now, after Fadl Rahman has died, because he was one of a kind, to even be able to engage the higher elite in about what Islam is. So now everybody goes to Bernard Lewis, this guy. But they look at Islam as a microscope. I'm almost finished. Every, criticizing every, every single aspect, criticizing every single hadith. Why did the Prophet have beard? Why did he say this? Why did the Prophet eat with his hands? Why did he do this? Criticizing every, and this is a whole subject. This is a subject in which you get a PhD in, in which thousands of people have written theses on. And the opposite of Orientalism is Occidentalism, where if you are in the East or if you are in the West, you look at the West under the microscope. You start looking and criticizing every aspect of their life. You start criticizing and looking at their, how they're doing things. And, and so the point I'm trying to make is, is that we are more influenced by them and their critique, and we're shy because of them towards Islam. But we don't have the attitude of accidentalism. We don't see what their society is doing wrong, and we don't own it that, yes, this society is doing this wrong. One extreme is to say they're doing nothing wrong. One extreme is to say they're doing everything wrong. But obviously every civilization has its dirty eggs. So you know, is tahzib ke ande hai gande. This is Iqbal's words. Uh, you know. So the point I'm trying to say is that uh, we should not be shy of the teachings of the Prophet And we should be able to give this to the next generation, which is why, again, we have 50 kids in the Sunday school, and tomorrow we have our fundraiser. So tomorrow we have our fundraiser. Please come, donate, because it'll help the kids. And please come downstairs. 
look at the game room. It's a little bit set up. We have the pool table. I need the brothers, the young brothers, to help me set that pool table up. Um, and also we have the library. It's 600, more than 600 books. Awesome, awesome books. Fabulous books. Uh, and uh, so please, uh, when you come tomorrow, bring your checks and give. Just give, just give. Inshallah will put barakah in what you give. And uh, we'll just take it from there. Let's do dua and let's pray, inshallah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina alab al-naf. Rabbana lulamna al-fusna wa illam taqfil lana wa alhamdulillah lana kuna min al-khasirin. Allahumma fil lana wa alhamdulillah. Allahumma, Allahumma taj'al al-Qur'ana rabiya khulubina wa nura sudurina. Allahumma ihdina al-sirat al-mustaqim. Allahumma ihdina al-sirat al-mustaqim. اللهم حبب علينا اللهم حبب لنا لنا إيمانا وعملا صالحا آمين اللهم آمين ثم من الله صل على محمد إن الله يعمل بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القرب وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم تستجب لكم فأقيموا الصلاة